Baptist Church. Uh, we're so glad to have you in attendance tonight. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Let me begin by saying thank you uh, to our associate pastors, uh, to Matt and Corbin, who filled in for me the last couple of services so that we could take a little vacation uh, celebrating our anniversary. Uh, and so appreciate them taking care of things and uh, all the staff working together while I was gone. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with our Wednesday night service, again, I normally uh, answer questions and do topics for people. So if you have a question you always wanted to know about the, the Bible, uh, then be sure and email us or snail mail us or let us know and we'll work together uh, to come up with a Wednesday night uh, topical study on that. On Sundays, I normally preach through books of the Bible, except for special occasions like Christmas, Easter, and Mother's Day. We have something else going on, but normally that's the way uh, we work this. Uh, tonight we're going to be doing kind of a follow-on to my earlier message on uh, uh, 419 about the coronavirus. A little bigger picture tonight, we're going to be talking about the coronavirus and the UN Agenda 2030. Uh, in my earlier sermon, uh, we asked the question, is this coronavirus a sign of the end of the world, was what I was asked several times. And I answered that I did not think the COVID-19 pandemic uh, was one of the plagues or pestilences listed among the judgments in the book of Revelation. I said that I thought the coronavirus was more like a drill or a simulation or a dress rehearsal to work out the bugs to get all the nations prepared for a final world government um, uh, that was described by the prophet Daniel and also by Jesus in his Olivet Discourse in the Gospels. Uh, the Apostle Paul also referred to this in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 as the mystery of iniquity uh, that is already at work and would even be more so uh, during the end of days. Tonight we will see the Apostle John uh, refers to this same mystery of iniquity in 1 John chapter 4, verse 3. He refers to it as the spirit of Antichrist, which is already now in the world. Uh, now, several people referred to my earlier coronavirus sermon as a conspiracy theory. However, the technical definition of a conspiracy is a secret plan. And in the past, the globalist billionaires did gather in secret and various you know, resorts around the world, but now they're so bold as to publish uh, what they're uh, planning to do online. So. If you want to check on that, uh, you can go to the United Nations website and look up the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And there you will find the master plan to unite humanity into a perfect new world order. And they include the exciting news that this one world order will become our new normal in less than 10 years uh, in the year 2030. Uh, so we ask you to prepare for this uh, session tonight by going to 1 John chapter 4, and there we will read 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Look back to verse 3 there. It says, Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. That was in the time of John in the first century. Here we are at the 21st century, so even more so. Also in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18, it says, In the last days, a world leader known as the Antichrist, is how John describes him, will appear and dominate the, the world through a one-world government. And we see the details about that in Revelation 13, which we'll be studying about in a few weeks. We also saw that in the earlier sermon that I preached uh, from Daniel chapter 2, 7, 8, and 11, and also Matthew 24 and in 2 Thessalonians 2. Now, when I say Antichrist, I'm not talking about some villain in a horror movie. 
Anti is actually the Greek prefix that means to be against, to be an adversary, to be opposed. So the Antichrist is a person who will appear as a world ruler in the end times who will be empowered by Satan who will work against Christ. He will be an adversary of Christ and he will stand in opposition to Jesus Christ. But long before this real Antichrist appears on the scene, the Apostle John says there will be a spirit of Antichrist which will pervade the world and prepare the way for him. That spirit of Antichrist is at work in the world today, and it's not some secret conspiracy theory. There's actual plan. The plan is in print. You can read it for yourself. As I said earlier, go to the United Nations and look up 2030 uh, Agenda for Sustainable Development. It's a 40-page document filled with a wonderfully sounding description of a perfect utopian plan for all humanity. This document includes 92 paragraphs with 17 sustainable goals and 169 targets. Paragraph 50 of that document warns us that we may be the last generation to have a chance to have saving the planet if we don't get this done by 2030, which is probably the source of the statement made by Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez from New York, who said in 2019, the world is going to end in 12 years if we don't address climate change. In Agenda 2030, the word sustainable is found 201 times in the 40 pages. Their point is, is that our current world is unsustainable. There are too many people consuming too much stuff and producing too much waste, um, and we're polluting our land, our air, our water. We're destroying the planet. But never fear, the UN is here, and they have a plan to fix everything in a 15-year period. They launched it in 2015. They want it to be complete by 2030. If the people of the world will simply unite and do as you're told and give the United Nations between 5 and $7 trillion in taxes, then everything will be okay. The United Nations has a plan to save the world and to build a utopia, a literal heaven on earth. By now, you may be thinking, well, what do you get? For five to seven trillion dollars, that's a lot of money. Well, you get lots of free stuff. If you read the document, you'll see that there's freedom from poverty, free food, free education, free health care, free reproductive health, also known as birth control and abortion, free universal basic income, free smartphones, every, all kinds of free stuff for everyone. Uh, and of course, equally. Uh, and you know it's true because this 2030 agreement was signed by leaders of 193 different socialist, communist, and Islamic governments from around the world, so you know those folks wouldn't tell you a lie. In 2015, Agenda 2030 was introduced and approved by Pope Francis as an important sign of hope. Also, former President Obama agreed, saying this is one of the smartest investments we can make in our own future. Now, for those who slept through social studies classes in high school, the Agenda 2030 plan is pure socialism, which has never worked before in the history of the world. It did not work on small scale. Uh, with the pilgrims who settled America in 1620, they nearly starved to death before they changed their plan to free markets. It did not work on a large scale with the Soviet Union or China, where millions of their people starved to death. Of course, a more recent example is Venezuela. But for some reason, the United Nations leaders believe socialism will work on a global scale as a one-world government. Now, when I say socialism is the spirit of Antichrist, it is. Uh, the Agenda 2030 document offers solutions for humanity that are anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-Christian, and anti-Bible. For the sake of time, we'll try to do about five of those. We'll do five quick examples. First of all, example number one, Matthew 4.10, Jesus said, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. But in the spirit of Antichrist, UN Agenda 2030 makes no mention of God or his son Jesus Christ. It does make one mention of Mother Earth in paragraph 59, which is as close as it comes to a deity. But the word we is written hundreds of times. And I was wondering who we is. So I looked in paragraph one, and there I found that we are the heads of state and governments and high representatives of the United Nations meeting at the United Nations headquarters in New York from September 25th through the 27th, 2015, on the 70th anniversary of the UN. Paragraph 53 says, the future of humanity and of our planet lies in our hands. 
And that sounded strangely familiar to me. It sounded like the Humanist Manifesto from 1973 that says, no deity will save us, we must save ourselves. Paragraph 91, we reaffirm our unwavering commitment to achieve uh, this agenda, utilizing it to the full to transform our world for the better by 2030. And again, I thought, well, where did I hear that before? And that was a phrase used by Barack Obama the week before the 2008 elections uh, that elected him as president. He said, we are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. Now that he's no longer the president, he's on the road preaching Agenda 2030 to fundamentally change the world. In July 2018, former President Obama made a speech in South Africa where he said, those who have more money should share their earnings with the less fortunate. There's only so much you can eat. There's only so big a house you can have. There's only so many nice trips you can take. I mean, it's enough. We're going to have to consider new ways of thinking about our problems like universal income, review of the work week, how we can retrain our young people. The rich need to get smaller houses, which all sounded very good, except after he finished his speech, President Obama returned to the United States of America to his $8.1 million home, eight bedroom, nine and a half bathroom mansion with swimming pool and security fence in one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the world. I was reminded of George Orwell's book, Animal Farm, which was a critique of Soviet communism where he said all animals are equal but some animals are more equal than others. Make no mistake these leaders at the UN who think they are God also think they are more equal than others. So that's example number one. Socialism seeks to transform the world away from God into a godless society that does whatever's right in their own eyes. Example number two Matthew 19 19 Jesus said honor your father and your mother. But in the spirit of Antichrist, Agenda 2030 makes no mention of parents or family. The UN thinks we don't need that Christian idea of family with a father and a mother who love each other and nurture their children in faith and godliness. As Hillary Clinton titled her book in 1995, it takes a village, a global village, that will educate your children with the necessary skills for this brave new world that we are inventing. Goal number four of Agenda 2030 says there'll be free preschool, free primary and secondary education, access to free tech school or university depending on your preference. And of course, all this free education from the time you're born means let the government raise your children. According to goal number four, free education includes plenty of classes on sustainability, environmentalism, sex education, gender sensitivity, human rights, cultural inclusiveness, nonviolence, and equal opportunity, I mean economic equality. I looked and I didn't see much about reading, writing, or arithmetic when it comes to the curriculum. This education, though, seems to be already working. According to the Gallup poll in 2018, 50% of our young adults age 18 to 29 have a favorable view of socialism. Maybe that explains why the Democrat Party is actually calling itself socialist. I mean, the Republican establishment are also socialists, they just hadn't said it yet. This United Nations education is not just for kids. Agenda 2030 uh, provides lifelong learning opportunities. You can read about that in paragraph 25 and in goal number four. So yes, if you're one of those hardheads like me that still clings to your God, your guns, and your Bible, uh, you're going to need some lifelong learning. I think that is double speak for re-education camps, or as the Russians used to call it, the gulag, where you will stay until you learn what sustainability means. Example number three, Matthew 19, 18, Jesus says, do not commit adultery. Do not commit sexual immorality. But the spirit of Antichrist says adultery is okay. Sexual immorality is okay. The LGBTQ lifestyle is okay. The only problem with adultery is babies, and we got too many of them. Therefore, Agenda 2030 focuses on women, the education of women, the empowerment of women, the entrepreneurship of women, the need for women in government and positions of power, it says. The women and girls theme is repeated 31 times in this document. Men are only mentioned uh, five times in passing. And I was wondering, why do they have such special emphasis on empowering women? 
especially since most of the dictators who sit at the United Nations Assembly uh, are men. But then I stumbled upon a world population website that kind of put it all together for me. It says, when women follow their traditional role of being wives and mothers, they tend to have too many children. So the way to fix the planet is to make women feel more like men. The more they worry about their career, the fewer children they have. So let women commit adultery all they want, which don't want babies. So the United Nations will give women free birth control and abortion to empower them to have less kids and lead the world. Also, I think one of the reasons for choosing women is women tend to be less belligerent, less willing to fight back against a global government. Men seem to have too much testosterone, so we treat our boys with large doses of Ritalin so they can sit you know, on the couch and be couch potatoes playing video games instead of going outside and pretending to be patriotic soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. Speaking of birth control, uh, China is being used by the liberals as a model for population control. If you remember, they had a one-child policy for decades um, with strict punishments if you disobeyed, but the problem was they had the unintended consequence of a shortage of girls. So in 2015, they changed to a two-child policy. I couldn't help but think, does anybody remember Genesis chapter 1? Genesis 1, 28, God blessed the man and the woman, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over every living thing that moves on the earth. So apparently our Lord, when he created this world, he created the earth, he thought it was big enough for us. But apparently once you become a billionaire, you don't uh, think that's true. You worry about having too many babies born that they might have to cause you to give up some of your money or power. I remember reading, I guess it's about 10 years ago, I read where Oprah Winfrey was among the billionaires who helped initiate uh, President Obama and Secretary of State Clinton's Global Health Initiative, which is a fancy label for reducing world population. In July 2018 edition of Oprah's magazine called O, uh, there was an article in there about shout your abortion, no longer be ashamed, celebrate the fact that you've had an abortion, and talk about what a positive experience was. As I read that, I thought, isn't it ironic how once Oprah got a billion dollars, she forgot that she was born into poverty in rural Mississippi to a teenage single mother. Now, I can't, couldn't help but wonder if she ever thought about the fact that if somebody back then was imposing the rules that she wants to impose now, would she even be alive today? By the way, how many people can the world sustain? According to world a meter got 7.8 billion right now, and according to the World Population Balance website, at 7 billion, we have three times what the world can sustain, so that means about 4.5 billion of us need to disappear. If you want to get a second opinion on that, you can take a field trip to Elberton, Georgia, where the Georgia Guidestones are. If you've never been there before, it's a beautiful place out in the middle of a cow pasture with something that looks like a mini Stonehenge with granite slabs. And one of those says 500 million is all the world can sustain. And that means, what, six and a half billion of us need to go somewhere. Example number four. In Matthew chapter 19 and verse 18, Jesus says, you shall not steal, which implies that God's plan for humanity allows for private property. According to God's law, there is a boundary between what is mine and what is yours. But in the spirit of Antichrist, also known as socialism, it says that in the name of, of equality, you don't have a right to private property. You ought to redistribute your wealth. Everybody ought to have things equally. Agenda 2030 recommends uh, herding humanity into carefully managed cities uh, where they're sustainable, safe, and secure. Uh, we see that in goal number 11, which explains, I guess, the trend toward tiny houses. When I think about tiny houses, though, I think it's a throwback to the Soviet flats and apartments where five and six families shared space together back in the former Soviet Union. I guess you could call them safe because they had confiscated your guns, and also you could call them secure because you're being watched by cameras and neighbors and uh, the Soviet secret police. You could also call them sustainable because your neighbors would snitch on you if you ate too much food or used too much water or toilet paper. Speaking of food, the United Nations has decided that there's way too much food waste going on in the world. The late former 
Undersecretary General of the United Nations, Morris Strong, said, quote, it is clear that current lifestyles and consumption patterns of the affluent middle class involving high meat intake, consumption of large amounts of frozen and convenient foods, ownership of motor vehicles, numerous electrical appliances, home and workplace air conditioning, expensive suburban housing are not sustainable. Did you hear that? What we used to call the American dream is no longer sustainable, according to these folks. And in paragraph 29, the United Nations will manage the way you produce and you consume goods and services. If you've never experienced rationing, I think that's what they're talking about. And the way they're going to monitor this is something called IoT, the Internet of Things. Former General and CIA Chief David Petraeus a few years ago was talking about the Internet of Things, and he talked about how all the electronic devices in our lives are transmitting data and then he laughed and said, we'll spy on you through your dishwasher. And so, sure enough, all of our smart appliances are capable now these days of transmitting data. We don't know where and to who or whatever. I noticed a while back a commercial that showed a refrigerator with a camera on the inside. And of course, what they said is if you get off the grocery store and forget whether you had a gallon of milk or not, you can always look inside. Well, if you can look inside, guess what? Somebody else can look inside. So maybe they mean business here. Land policy. In order to save the planet, we need to get some people off the land and into manageable cities. We read about that in goal number six. 6.6 .6 says they need to protect and restore water-related ecosystems, including mountains, forests, wetlands, rivers, aquifers, and lakes. You go through that list, I think that includes about everything. They're talking about putting all these green space areas into government-controlled national parks and management areas. If you want to see what that looks like, you can Google search Agenda 21 map and you'll see the areas that they're going to allow us to inhabit and the areas that will be off limits. Not only should you have no right to personal property, nations should not have the right to national property. The way they look at it, the earth belongs to all earthlings. You need to begin to imagine a world with no boundaries and no borders. And so now you begin to see why there's such a pushback on the idea of building a huge wall on the southern border. In a world with no borders, you don't need any walls. Goal, chapter, goal 10, uh, paragraph 7, says they intend to facilitate orderly, safe, regular, and responsible migration and mobility of people. That means, once again, once you lose your national borders, that people are free to come and go as they please anywhere in the world that they please. By the way, this migration of people is part of a long-standing UN plan suggested by Richard Kalergi, who died back in 1973, but he was an early advocate of world government, and Kalergi said the man of the future will be of mixed race. Uh, today's races will gradually disappear owing to the vanishing of space, time, and prejudice. The Eurasian Negroid race of the future will be similar in its appearance to the ancient Egyptians. And by the way, they present a clergy award every year to world leaders who are advancing the cause of this world citizenship. Previous recipients that you might recognize are Angela Merkel from Germany, Emmanuel Macron from France, Henry Kissinger and Bill Clinton from the United States, and of course, Pope Francis from the Vatican. And I don't know, I, I guess this explains the mass migration of Muslims from North Africa and the Middle East into Western Europe. I assume the social engineers think they will fight for about 20 years and then they will marry and have Egyptian children who are neither Christian nor Muslim. Now, before you label me a racist, uh, the Bible does not condemn interracial marriage. It condemns interreligious marriage. And so I'm not against interracial marriage. If both are Christians and you feel like the Lord is leading you to do that, then more power to you. However, I am against those UN dictators deciding to force Christians and Muslims together in a genetic experiment to make a race of Egyptian atheists who will be slaves for some billionaire's idea of a new world order. Yes, I'm against that. Now, if you don't own anything or have private property, then it naturally follows that you should have no expectation of privacy. And that brings us to paragraph number 70 of this document. It speaks of an online platform to monitor progress on Agenda 2030 goals. I read in a separate article where Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, Apple, Facebook, and et cetera are very enthusiastic about Agenda 2030. Matter of fact, they've entered into partnership with the United Nations to make this happen. 
United Nations wants to build a new worldwide computer system that will connect everyone. Goal 16.9, by 2030, they want to provide legal identity for all, including birth registration. I need to stop here and tell you that five times in the document it says, no one will be left behind. So everybody's going to be swept up into this computer system so that they can keep up with your identity. If you'll remember in an earlier sermon, I mentioned that in Davos at the World Economic Forum in 2019, they announced ID 2020. And so apparently they're not going to wait on 2030 to make sure that everybody in the world gets identification. So I guess we wait on something to be rolled out between now and the end of the year. Goal 1718. They intend to increase significantly the available of high-quality, timely, reliable data, data disaggregated by income, gender, age, race, ethnicity, migratory status, disability, and geographic location. Think about that for a minute. How would you do that? It must be a powerful computer system that's going to keep all that amount of information on every human being on the planet. And of course, 1719, they assure us that the only reason they want this data is to, uh, is to measure our progress on these sustainable development goals. On a related topic, goal three uh, talks about universal free health care for everybody in the world, and of course it's also connected to this information system. Uh, by the way, here's where I wanted to stop and make the connection about the coronavirus. In goal three, uh, point eight and B, there are two statements about vaccines for everyone. And then in goal 3.3, .3, they talk about, they plan the end of epidemics of all communicable diseases by 2030. I want you to think about that. Out of this huge document, there are only three references, three short sentences about epidemics and vaccines and all of those 17 goals and 169 targets. And then what I want you to think about is just two lines in this plan but look at the real world impact from those three little lines about epidemics and vaccines. In the case of COVID-19, the United Nations and the Associated World Health Organization had governments all around the world ordering social distancing, sheltering in place, closing of businesses, collapsing of the global economy, millions of people unemployed, and trillions of dollars added to debt over what is now being called by the Centers for Disease Control the equivalent of a bad flu year. Think about that. That means behind every little line in this Agenda 2030, there are hundreds of pages of technical, bureaucratic rules and regulations and orders ready to be implemented when the time is right for them to be implemented. Another one of those goals about your property has to do with uh, goal 17-10, or dot 10, is they want to promote a universal, equitable trading system under the World Trade Organization. What they're talking about there is a cashless society, they're talking about digital money. And if you want more information on that, just do a little internet search on Bitcoin or blockchain or cryptocurrency. But this cashless thing is coming. Uh, they were all, already trying to get it done while we were doing the COVID-19 thing, but apparently they ran into some problems in Congress. Goal 8, uh, dot 10, talking about digital money, uh, is going to expand access to banking, insurance, finance, and services for all. And what that means is if you need money to build your tiny house or you want to take that cruise that you put off or you want to start a business, no worries. There's going to be equal, easy credit for everyone. Except as I got to thinking about that, I got to thinking about, wait a minute, China. China, again, is the model for this new world order, and they've already introduced something called a social credit score. And what that means is if you need money, the Chinese Communist Party checks to see if you pay your taxes, if you eat healthy, if you say nice things about the government. They also check to make sure you're not one of those pesky Christians before they decide to loan you some money. By the way, here in the United States, back in 2017, we learned that Facebook is also doing something very similar to this with something called a trustworthy algorithm. I kind of wonder what my score is about right now. Kind of reminds you of Revelation 13, 16. He, the beast, the Antichrist, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. He doesn't leave anybody behind, and no one may buy or sell or get free stuff except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Wow, look at the time. 
we've only done about a few of these 17 uh, sustainable goals. I want to do one more, but before we go there, let's, let's have a couple of comments about timing. Today, if you look at your calendar, it's June the 3rd, 2020. These globalist powers that be plan to have this Agenda 2030 thing done by 2030. So that means we're in for some exciting times over the next 10 years. Also, our current president claims that he wants to make America great again. Well, I looked through Agenda 2030 and I didn't see anything in there about that being part of the plan, so I don't think the United Nations leadership wants the president to have four more years. We've already witnessed an impeachment trial like 1974, a pandemic like 1918, and a ride in the streets like 1968, so I think we're also in for some exciting times between now and November. And one more thing. The year 2030 was an interesting choice to me. Many Bible scholars believe the year of the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was A.D. 30, which means 2030 will mark exactly 2,000 years from the cross of Christ. And if you're a Christian who reads your Bible, you need to think about that a little bit. What is it Peter said? A day with the Lord is a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years is a day. Probably ought to meditate on that one a few minutes. Again, I believe we're in for exciting times in the next 10 years. I encourage you to read your Bibles. I encourage you to pay attention to the news. And I encourage you to pray for wisdom as we seek as Christians to figure out how to navigate these troubled times that we're living in. Okay, finally, example number five. Matthew 19, 18, Jesus said, You shall not bear false witness. You shall not lie. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But the spirit of Antichrist says, wait a minute, the Bible is not true. There's no Christ who will save us. There's no God. There's no everlasting life. Uh, this life is all there is. There is no heaven after this is over. When you die, you are simply dead. But cheer up. Socialism provides you the best life now, the most equality now, uh, the best life for everybody in the world now. Don't listen to these tinfoil hat conspiracy theorists who believe in Jesus. And so there you have it. Who are you going to trust? You're going to trust the socialist ideas of Agenda 2030, which is the unproven ideas of Karl Marx, Vladimir Lenin, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, Saul Alinsky, whose bodies lie dead in their graves? Or are you going to listen to Jesus, who lived and died and rose again, and behold, he lives forevermore, and the Bible says he's coming back soon, and I believe very soon. Hopefully this message will help you better understand the craziness of our current American political system while you're sitting there yelling at your TV because you see politicians making all kind of crazy choices and decisions. But I do want you to remember this. Most of our politicians are not working for the people. They are working for billionaire bankers and businessmen who give them the money to run for the office so that they can fundamentally transform our world. Again, as the Apostle John said that we quoted in the beginning, 1 John chapter 4, verse 3, this spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, is already in the world. So what is a Christian supposed to do in this environment? Well, Matthew 24, 12, Jesus said, in the last days, lawlessness will abound, chaos will abound, anarchy will abound. And the love of many will grow cold. But what? He who endures, he who keeps on loving, he keeps on following Jesus, he who endures to the end shall be saved. John picks up on this and adds in 1 John 4, 4, You are of God, little children, and you have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You say, well, Danny, how can a Christian, I mean, we're outgunned on every side. They got more money. They got more political power. How can a Christian be victorious over the deception and confusion and craziness that's going on in our world? Well, 1 John 5, 4 answers that. Whoever is born of God overcomes this world, and this is a victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. We can overcome 
we can be victorious through faith in Jesus Christ. And of course, faith means to believe, trust, and obey God, regardless of which form of human government happens to be in charge at any given time, whether it's Democrats or Republicans, whether it's communist or capitalist, whether it's nationalist or globalist, it doesn't matter. He's still on the throne. And as Christians, we are called to keep on loving, even if the world around us is hateful. We're called to keep on believing in Jesus, even when the elite people of the world call us ignorant or deplorable or conspiracy theorists. We're to keep on obeying Christ's commandments, even when the world around us tells us there is no Christ. We're to keep on being faithful to Christ, even if we're surrounded by a faithless and perverse generation. Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus makes some precious promises to overcomers. He says, To him or her, or her who overcomes, I will give you access to the tree of life in the paradise of God. To him or her who overcomes, I will give you eternal life. To him or her who overcomes, I will give you a new name written in the book of life. To him or her who overcomes, I will confess your name before God the Father and his angels. He'll stand in front of the God Almighty himself and say, Well done, good and faithful servant. To him or her who overcomes, he said, I will clothe you in white garments of wholeness and give you access to the new Jerusalem, the holy city. To him or her who overcomes, he said, I will give you a seat around my throne. To him and her who overcomes, I will be your God, and you will be my people forever. So what are you going to do? Are you going to conform to the new atheist, socialist world order that's being built? Or are you going to overcome the world through faith in Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Lord, from our perspective, we're living in some pretty difficult times. Help us to be faithful during this desperate hour. I pray, Lord, if there's one who is listening to our service tonight, man, woman, boy, or girl, that's never trusted Christ as their Savior and Lord, I pray that you would stir in their heart and realize that the hour is late, later than any of us think. And if they're going to trust you, they need to do it now while it's still called today. Lord, lead them to repent of their selfishness and sin, to believe in your son, Jesus Christ, so they can be saved.